Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming out on a uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, thank you to the Humanist Society for arranging this talk. And, uh, and also, I want to thank you for promoting me. I'm actually not an associate professor. Not me. Assistant <laughs> <laughs> professor. But anyway, um, today I, I'm really very happy to come out and talk about, about the book. Um, and also to have an opportunity to, I call this sort of a, a giving back to uh, the people from the gay community who, who had taken a lot of time to speak to me um, that, uh, for several years, for meeting up and just chatting with me. So um, I hope that uh, this is something that we can continue uh, discussion about. And of course, I want to thank uh, many of you, all the informants whom I talked to in the book, including Alex, uh, who's temporarily not in the room at the moment. Um, and also uh, Temple University Press, which is the original publisher of the book, and then also NUS Press. Sebastian's looking at me, so I have to <laughs> thank you to NUS Press for uh, picking up the Asia Pacific Rights so that it's made uh, available at a very affordable rate uh, price uh, in the region. So my focus today is not to talk about everything in the book. It's not possible to do that. Uh, it was actually quite impossible to do it within 80,000 words, but I managed to. So um, this is what I'd like to focus on today, just partly about uh, strategy and tactics of the gay community, uh, the groups, uh, the trajectory, how the group developed and morphed over time. And also, lastly, I want to finish about uh, the means of how the uh, local communities of rights that I learned from the gay community. Uh, but before that, coming back here, uh, I just want to say a little bit about the book title as a preface. I never had this issue, I never thought it would have an issue until the book was actually um, uh, published in Singapore. People kept asking me, why did you come up with such a title? Um, and is it a call to bear arms or something like that? And I have to tell you, the, the origin of this title is actually uh, very boring. Uh, we were just coming, we meeting the editors at Temple and, 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 and me. We, the two, we were just trying to come up with a title that's the, the part before the colon, and you throw everyone after the colon. But the, the part before the colon uh, has to be really, they want it really succinct and to capture the essence of what the book is about. The book is about a group of people who are working on uh, organizing, mobilizing, so obviously it's descriptive. And uh, who are they mobilizing? What is she doing mobilizing around? Like, what is it? This is very simple. And I keep getting questions from you know, people who are from the gay community and also people who are opposing. It's very sensitive about this title. But anyway, I just want to make it clear. I'm sorry it's not as exciting as you think it is. <laughs> and uh, okay. so I wanted to talk, first of all, before we get to um, sort of this flow of, of content, um, how I actually um, conducted the research. Um, it is a research, piece of research is actually based on field work. So what I, I have to say today is not something that I think about uh, from, you know, from the comfort of my room only. Um, it's really what I learned from uh, interviews uh, with, uh, well, it just turned out to be a really nice number, 100 of uh, activists and community organizers. I actually contacted uh, more than 100, some declined, some never replied. Um, that's how I ended up with a neat number of 100. Uh, also, um, I looked at uh, the movement organizations, documents, uh, press releases over the span of more than 20 years. I also looked at government statements, legislation, uh, parliamentary debates, and so on. So this is uh, the, what I have to say. It's very much informed by the research, of course, anchored in uh, academic literature, which I won't bore you with. So I'll just strip that and talk to you about the, the data analysis. And uh, so what I want to focus on is talk about the context, Singaporean context. I don't want to say too much about the part that's not bolded, like evil conditions or social conditions of being um, gay or lesbian in Singapore, because um, I'm not I'm giving this talk here. But I want to focus a little bit about political norms, how activism does characterize what are the norms of mobilizing in Singapore. So I'll talk about strategies and tactics that activists here use. As Alex said, a lot of you um, may recognize that it's like herding a bunch of cats around. And this is not to imply that, you know, the, when I say strategy and tactics, it, does, it doesn't imply that all of you are very coordinated and you all got to get in the room and say, this is the strategy that we are going to carry out in the span of over the next 20 or 30 years. 
And, but that's, I think that makes it equally remarkable, or even more remarkable in the sense that even if when there's a that's, there's less of this intentional getting together of plotting out a strategy. Um, every, what all of you seem to, the strategies that carry out, been carried out over the years, fall within a particular mold, which I find pretty remarkable, or not surprising at the same time. And then in the course of talking about strategy and tactics, I'll also show how the tactics, strategy-wise, has not changed much. Tactically, it has morphed over the years, uh, through different phases of the movement and finding out close with what does this tell us about how uh, what about the politics of gay rights uh, in Singapore. And this is a caveat. Uh, sometimes people describe the book as being about LGBT history. Actually, it's not because um, I very intentionally said I am not, this book was not equipped or adequate enough to cover uh, transgender issues. So I, so I only focus on LG, well, I'm not sure about B, but definitely L and G, uh, the, 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 that aspect of the sexual minority uh, community in Singapore. So I want to now move on to talking about the uh, context of mobilizing in Singapore, uh, focusing only on the political norms, first of all. Um, these are the norms that many of you will be very familiar with when I've written them. And it comes out very clearly as patterns, very clear patterns that introduce and what you do over the course of uh, more than 20 years since the, since the beginning of the movement in the very early 90s. And it, it, it can be boiled down into four types of political norms. And one is the idea that we do politics, whether it's civil society politics, or more specifically about uh, gay community organizing. Number one, uh, you have to come across as being non-confrontational toward the government. That's a, that's a very clear stance that I see of describing the way of politics here. And it, it's not that like we can have any clear definition of what confrontation or non-confrontation means. It is what the state thinks, perceives as not being confrontational. Uh, number two is the idea of uh, preserving social harmony, the, the sense that the state wants to come across as uh, being able to preserve and be in control of preserving this idea of social harmony. And that's very much linked to the, uh, making sure that the economy and gender country um, can uh, continue. So uh, that's another note that activists keep pointing to and imply when they talk about what they do and why they do these things. Uh, number three, and that's very important, is the idea of uh, legal legitimacy. Now, uh, legal conditions are the former legal conditions, but here legal legitimacy hinges more on the, on the cultural power of law. And that means it's not just about the law being able to uh, provide concrete sanctions or rewards. It's the idea that law can give you uh, legitimacy in Singapore. So in the sense that all, uh, a lot of activists talk about, and, the, and also manifesting what we do is uh, we have to come across as being legal and law-abiding. For instance, uh, from the smallest thing about holding a talk to a big event like King Doc, for instance, there's a huge emphasis on legality. And that's because if you're being illegal or being at least interpreted by the state as being uh, a lawbreaker, you lose that political credibility or that legitimacy. Activists often point to um, po uh, opposition politicians who have been um, you know, in, uh, involved in a lot of, uh, involved in, for example, civil uh, disobedience and being prosecuted by the law, or being sued for defamation. And there's a sense that uh, transgression of formal law brings, uh, loses you political credibility or uh, legitimacy. So the idea of legality was very important in, in what people said, why they did certain things, and you can see manifesting the actions even today, from the early 90s up to today. Number four, no surprise there is the idea that um, the ruling party's uh, hegemony has to be preserved, or at least the uh, conveying or preserving the, uh, that, uh, that message, or conveying the message to the ruling party that their hegemony is not under threat, whatever you do. And so that those four norms, impliedly or um, in what the interviews have, have shown to me, are the norms that are very important to mobilizing uh, community organizing in Singapore for, for gay activists and perhaps uh, more broadly across the spectrum of civil society. So I just want to bear that in mind. 
I mean, that's, because it's very important to understanding how the strategy plays out. Because um, the way I conceptualize it is that the strategy is um, is, a, is an adaptation to political, not just the formal law, but also the political norms and signals that change over time. It's what sometimes in social movement, social movement literature we call uh, strategic adaptation. So, um, sorry about this, I'm not very adequate with graphs. But what I'm trying to show is that the strategy of uh, Singapore's gay movement is primarily driven by a strategy that I call pragmatic resistance. And I explain this term, it's not really much to do with Singapore being a pragmatic state, it's a different uh, route to it. But the idea of pragmatic resistance is that you are simultaneously, and people in the theater circle would realize it, uh, towing the line and pushing the boundaries of these political norms. When you push boundaries, you are sort of changing or making gains for the movement. All movements want to advance, right? So that's sort of the uh, aspect of the movement where you're trying to uh, achieve change. And here it's about pushing the boundaries. And it's in the delicate balance with uh, towing the line, where you have the same time you have to come across as, as, as uh, abiding by all these political norms, right? Uh, and if you push boundaries too much, you're going to be trespassing, and that could get you into trouble. But if you told the line too much, you're too conservative, and nothing happens, nothing changes. So the idea of pragmatic resistance came about for me as I looked at the data from the interviews, uh, my observations of what people do, and so on. Um, just another, ch I'm quite, looking back, maybe I should call it different, but uh, different, uh, a different term, but I think I said by at the end, is this pragmatic resistance. Why do I use the term pragmatic? It's not because people are, people are often asking, is it because you're trying to describe Singaporeans and the government as being pragmatic? Actually, no. Uh, this is more inspired by a school of thought um, called American Pragmatism, and uh, has, in, has influenced uh, a uh, study of sociology of culture. And that basically means um, the idea that social actors, all of us as social actors, respond to uh, signals and shifts in our environment and uh, perhaps change our actions accordingly or decide to reinforce whatever we're doing depending on our interpretation of those uh, events or, or shifting signals. So um, it actually has more root in the idea of, uh, in the school of thought of pragmatism that's influenced sociology of cultures, which has a deep influence on my study of law and society, which is uh, in the area of sociology of law. So that's how the term pragmatic resistance comes about. Very, very little to do with how sometimes people say it's because Singapore's a, a sing a Singapore is a pragmatic, a pragmatic. That's not really what it is. But this idea of pragmatic resistance, uh, the towing the line, pushing the boundaries, has permeated the, the movement of activists do from the very beginning. And I will use, uh, it when I talk about the development of the movement over time, I use some examples of their tactics and to illustrate what happens and uh, what some of the classic examples of, of pragmatic resistance technically in tactical uh, form. So you can bear with me and I just hold that for a minute. I'll get uh, I'll give you more examples and illustration. So um, I chart the movement as uh, having been conceived in the early 1990s and I divided it over to, uh, based on the nature of the, of the tactics. Even though there are pragmatic resistance over time, the tactics are not uh, into four phases. Um, Alex has sort of alluded to the first, uh, tumorous beginnings, or mostly that's very much linked to a group that I call the coalition in the book. <laughs> and then uh, this a period of cyber organizing, um, organizing on the internet. And now that's not to say that people don't do it anymore, but during that particular period of time, that was really most of what the activist groups were doing. And then there's a transition period into mobilizing back into physical spaces, not just on the internet, uh, and it continues uh, in this contemporary uh, era. So, and as we go through, as we go through these four periods, what you'll see is um, the trajectory of the movement, movement is that you see the movement coming up, not uh, not people individually coming out about the sexuality, but the coming out of the movement, being publicly identified and willing to be identified uh, as gay activists, um, as people uh, like Alex and folks from his generation will tell you, in the very early 1990s, it was a fear of being identified as 
an activist of any sort. So coming out of the movement, right? And then you also see that movement has diversified in terms of the types of groups, what sort of specific groups within the community they target. An expansion, um, not just people who are gay working on these issues, but uh, also straight allies getting involved. And escalation of tactics from uh, small meeting room spaces to open, openly mobilizing, for example, in, in the park, or uh, going to uh, mobilizing uh, around uh, certain individuals to go to court. These are tactical escalations that you see over time. And then you also see a shifting of attitudes and opening up spaces. By that, um, this is more of a correlation. I'm not claiming any real causal relationship, which is notoriously hard to prove in terms of talking about social movement outcomes. But you see a correlation of shifting attitudes in terms of opening up political spaces, media spaces uh, as well. So media, uh, perhaps they are not entirely openly about uh, supporting uh, the gay community, but at least they are now presenting, or at least trying to present more of a balanced view as opposed to in the early 1990s when the old timers remember uh, the only time sexual minorities were featured was when there was criminal deviancy involved or there's some kind of a sting operation uh, involved at certain parts of the island. So the opening up political spaces and shifting the media uh, coverage as well. Okay, so I want to come back to uh, talk a little bit more about Timur's beginnings, which is the first phase of the movement. Um, they were, you have to remember, prior to this period was the uh, 1980s. What do you remember of the 1980s in Singapore? In terms of civil society, do people recall anything? Maybe I'll turn you <laughs> Marxist oh. conspiracy, right? Uh, that was in the late 80s. But before that, um, also there was a period of uh, quite a bit of uh, civil society uh, springing up. There was um, the formation of uh, AWARE, a uh, women's group. There was the formation of an HIV AIDS group, um, AFA. Now these were uh, groups that in the very beginning allowed it even if limits it, lots of space for people with similar political views to come together, or at least when you got to those groups, you got to know people who are perhaps more friendly or supportive. Um, and over time, the um, you would see that some of the folks that actually ended up in the the, the in what I call coalition in the 19, early 1990s, the group that Alex belonged to. <laughs> um, some, there's some crossovers, right? Some overlaps, especially between the, the uh, AIDS organization and um, the first uh, gay group in, in Singapore. But the idea of uh, political organizing was also very, was seen, seen very dangerous um, in the early 1990s, also because of the legacy of the 1980s, and that was uh, the Marxist conspiracy. Some of the people, for example, uh, who were part of the founding of the first gay group in Singapore um, were part of the, um, where these new people were involved in the Catholic liberation movement as well. So they're very familiar with what the state do to people who are perceived as having crossed the line in, 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 in doing civil society politics. Right? And so there was this sense of, of fear, but at the same time, um, among those who founded the movement in the beginning, that the sense that they needed, needed to do something. There was a little bit of space with the rise, with the opening up of AWARE and HIV, the HIV AIDS organization. You have to understand that these groups were allowed to form not just because people wanted to, but the government sort of allowed this containment of, of uh, allowed a little bit of political space to contain political discourse as well. So it was in this sort of a mixed <coughs> mood that um, uh, organizing over gay issues uh, first began. The gay group was starting to meet in small in people's living rooms and eventually in a theater space. At the same time, um, there was this place known as Rascals, which would become um, sort of a symbol for people who are old timers of uh, one of the first 
uh, open engagement with the state when it comes to discrimination against uh, the gay community. Who's been to rat schools before? Okay, who else? Rascals no longer exist. The rascals were this event of place. Um, rascals was a was a disco on Beach Road. It had. Uh, <laughs> well, um, regardless of the location, <laughs> right? Um, it wasn't entirely a gay, uh, a, a, a gay establishment. It had um, it had certain nights that were catered, or you knew that certain nights were catered to a gay clientele, and um, it was quite well known. And uh, during this period of time that the police would uh, conduct raids on these gay establishments. Oftentimes, under, well, usually under pretext of some licensing issue or a regulatory issue like uh, overcrowding or noise and so on. So on this night, like any other raid, they actually look for identification documents. If you had IDs, you would be separated from those who did not. And those who did not have IDs would uh, take it to the police station. Um, and so one of the folks who ended up writing this letter that I would just call Rascal's letter is actually, was actually um, um, in the group that had identification. But this person was very indignant about it because um, the law actually does not empower the police uh, to detain or arrest you just because you're unable to produce your ID on the spot. You actually, well if they detain you, how can you go and say I have IDs at home? I, you know, can I go and show it? So actually, you have a right to be able to say, you know, I, if you, I can go and retrieve or produce it at the station. So this was, uh, in, uh, to him, he framed this letter to the police eventually as sort of a, um, the police had exceeded their authority. They were not allowed to simply detain people uh, in this way because, uh, just because people were not able to produce identification right on the spot. Now this letter was crafted in a very um, Singaporean way, we could call it in that sense, because it said nothing about discrimination against gay people. It, it, it said nothing about gay rights. It basically said that the police had exceeded their authority based on what they were allowed to do in the statute books. And that is a very, and there's nothing about, there's no open street protest or anything like that. He just got and whoever who was willing to sign the letter to sign it and submitted it to MHA, Ministry of Home Affairs, and the police. So this is one of the earliest uh, tactical form of strategic, uh, sorry, of practical resistance. And you already see in the sense that it doesn't, it deals with the political norms in a very sensitive way, non-confrontation, very deferential, but also using the idea of legal legitimacy, saying, look, the police are not acting according to the legality here. So guess what the police did about after a month? They actually wrote a letter of apology saying, we're well, sorry for being rude. <laughs> and they actually called out this letter writer and said, well, we actually had a, I don't know if it's actually true that they did it, but they told us, my informant, that they did it, was that they talked about um, uh, all these, uh, basically they talked about how they should behave in terms of uh, carrying out rates. So the administratively, there was a discussion about it. I don't know if that's true, right? Um, police would not engage with me when I requested for interviews. I got no reply. <laughs> so, um, but anecdotally, I mean, I tried to look through the newspapers. And newspapers are not good gauge as to whether the rates have subsided over the years, because sometimes they might not just be reported. Um, anecdotally, um, old timers seem to tell me, I'm sorry, Alex, I kept saying old timer. <laughs> Uh, would tell me that the sense that rates have gone down, except in cases where there is other forms of illegality involved, for instance, uh, where there's uh, uh, drug consumption on the premises. But that's uh, anecdotal, and I'm not able to find a better way of sort of gauging this. Um, so, from the early 1990s until 96, uh, this, uh, Alex's group were all meeting, and then they were also spurred on by the uh, by rascals. This uh, the sense of little 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 victory, if you want to call it that. But toward that end, the end of that period, they started to have scares um, because uh, I, there was a sense that they were under surveillance. And so, why, why were they scared? Because they were they were well, they are not registered as a group. 
Right. So the, the discussion of registration being legally legitimate came up. To make a long story short, they finally managed to find 10 people in Singapore willing to put their name and IC number on the application form. It was a really, really tough um, uh, sell to get people to sign their names. It's con as contrasted to repeal 377A in later years when people were more forward about putting their names on uh, an illegal document. Um, registration was denied on the grounds of public morality and so on, no surprise there. And then that would take us to the end of that period where uh, the group basically dispersed into, in, into uh, two forms. One was people who decided to run their own blog commentary on the internet and decided to learn about that. And then sort of the, 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 the Sunday gatherings that the group used to have um, became a mailing list. Right? But at this time, it wasn't just one group. On the internet, people were able to form other groups. There were lesbian groups that formed other groups that catered to uh, 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 reconciling um, sexuality with their religious faith. All came out. So during this period, organizing on the internet gave people that sense of security. Um, at the same time, it allowed them to sort of have connection with others who could, uh, who were just trying to come out. And then eventually, they would say, hey, you know, I'm going to have a, like, a private gathering or a small dinner. Why don't you join us? So that was sort of that period of time when there was a lot of, sort of consciousness raising on the internet, quite a lot of uh, community support. It was quite invisible, in terms of physical spaces, but they were happening. You know, small groups were meeting up informally and so on. Now, technically, if you want to get very technical, maybe all these groups were illegal because, you know, they are not really registered. But the internet seemed to give them a sense of security. Uh, whether it was rightly or wrongly. <laughs> and I'm going to move on now. So I just had quite, they were branching out, different groups were popping up. There was a, a group for Christians, a group for Buddhists, a group for lesbians, uh, several groups, and so on. The whole thing is uh, mostly uh, combined a lot of the organizing activity on, on the internet. Of course, people didn't meet up in person. right? And then there's a transition period. This was around the early 2000s, when Alex spoke about that. Several signs uh, you can use are the, the, on the uh, CNN interview say something about not persecuting gays. There was then Go Chok Chong in 2003 who talked about uh, civil service being non-discriminatory. I need to point out also that there I have not found any government policy that's actually been changed uh, to openly protect uh, discrimination, but that's what he said to Time Magazine in 2003. But those were interpreted as little positive signs and so the second registration by um, Alexis group uh, was uh, carried out. Now this time, there's a slight change in the tactical intent. Right in the beginning, in the first, in the 1990s, the intention was to actually try to get legal because they were afraid of getting clamped down. Right? And then when the rejection came, the group dispersed because all the numbers were doing, uh, the, the attendance rate was dwindling also. But in the second registration, the intention was quite different. The intention was to see how much did the state really mean about this so-called opening. You have a new prime minister, right? Uh, and you had, uh, well, a new prime minister by then for 10 years, who or at least a different minister, the prime minister was saying something different. Um, so let's see how much they mean by this sort of opening up of Singapore. So the registration was to test the boundaries, to push the boundaries and see what happens. Um, and this time, um, a meeting was called to get people to, again, somebody got assigned to, to, on paper to be the executive officer of this organization, right? They had no problem finding more, they actually had more than 10 people volunteering to sign up on this document, um, compared to the early, uh, to the mid-1990s, where they literally had to beg people uh, from the whole of Singapore population to sign. Um, no surprise, the second registration was application was also denied. Um, I, I looked at both versions of the letter from the mid 90s, uh, from the 1990s and from the 2004. I think it was almost a copy and paste job. It's more or less the same uh, explanation. Um, but this time, there was uh, not sort of uh, scuffling the efforts or, or trying to go into hiding. Um, people like Alex wrote letters. Um, actually, Alex got a column right in today about in the Today newspaper about the denial for registration. Um, the group put out a, a press release and so on. So this was sort of a changing tactic, right? We, 
uh, and in the press release, you now this is another uh, form of uh, sort of exposing what the state is doing to them, but also towing the line, so pushing the boundaries of our media, uh, public discourse, also towing the line. The letter, I don't have it word for word here, but I know very uh, vivid, remember very vividly. It says something along the lines of how the civil servants have, or denied the registration, have felt to uh, have, have contradicted, I'm paraphrasing, what Go Chok Tong and other leaders have said about Singapore changing. So here you are, it's sort of saying, this is, this is exposing what the wrong, what the wrong is, what has been done to the, to the gay uh, community group. But at the same time, showing deference to the top leaders, those are the ones that count in the ruling party, saying that, look, all these lowly bureaucrats are actually failed to live up to the enlightened vision <laughs> of the leaders. <laughs> it's to the political norms, at the same time, trying to get what you want to say out, right? So the sense of, the, uh, more, more, um, again, you see more open media engagement, because in the early 1990s, uh, besides uh, come, uh, suspecting that they were coming under uh, surveillance by ISD, there was um, a, a very um, there was a newspaper, um, and I think you know which newspaper was was sort of a tablet form of newspaper was try, trying to um, write up something very scandalous about the group in the early 1990s, and that everybody in, in the group was not prepared to engage with media. They're all running away from the media. But starting in the in this period, in the early 2000s, uh, the strategy changed. Uh, people like Alex uh, were, and others um, were actively engaging the press. Actually gave them phone numbers. Uh, maybe went out to lunch or coffee with them. So putting faces to who the leaders are in the gay community. So that aspect changed. There was more open media engagement. Of course, I will also say that perhaps um, the composition of the press of, of journalists in Singapore perhaps it changed over time as well. I, uh, people are perhaps still having to deal with the politics of being a journalist in Singapore, but perhaps also more open about uh, gay issues and as well. And, and during this period, what changed also was a reoccupation of physical spaces. So uh, more events were being held in more public spaces. And then you have several groups that started to occupy more permanent uh, visible spaces, like a community library uh, uh, with a collection of books about uh, gay communities and gay organizing. You had um, uh, Uga Chaga, which is uh, one of the few registered organizations that work with gay issues in Singapore. They register as a company and not like uh, trying to register under the Societies Act, which is which is subject to more stringent scrutiny in terms of whether how political they are. But as a company, you also get other forms of, of, of uh, scrutiny. Um, I would say that in Malaysia, for instance, there are civil society groups that have organized, uh, they have registered as companies, for instance, and they are being harassed by the government uh, on the basis of accounting or financial issues. So there's a, but uh, fortunately here in Singapore, uh, I've not known of the, the few gay groups that are registered as uh, um, companies have been coming to problem as well yet. So Ugachaga is one of the few ones. And then you have uh, the early beginnings of uh, a gay family church. Now these are groups that occupy spaces more visibly, physical spaces. But during this period, some of you may remember the circuit parties. Do you remember the uh, snowball or uh, nation? Do people remember that at Sentosa, right? Okay, um, and there was this period of time where there was some uh, foreign gay media sort of describing, almost portraying Singapore as sort of uh, the gay mecca of Asia. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this period where thousands, literally at this height, I think maybe 8,000 people who would come to, mostly gay men come to these parties. Uh, on the women's side, there were um, uh, parties as well, but nothing like uh, the, the men's. <laughs> now, this circuit party is not just, you know, it has something to do with indignation, I have to say. Do you remember what happened to, to this party? It basically got shut down. Um, after several years, they were no, no longer allowed the licensing. Um, up to this day, I'm still not sure what happened. There are several speculations. One possibility is that there was a lot of hoo ha made over the, the rise of HIV infection rates by a certain minister at that given period of time. 
and there was this line that he said newspaper of how these four men are coming to these parties and infecting local people. So that's, whether or not you agree with it, that was sort of the statement that was made at the time. And, but uh, more mundane explanation that I got was you know, the police officer was giving out this license over the years, was no longer in charge. <laughs> <laughs> So you never know about these things. So anyway, when the second parties got banned, um, Alexis group decided to, I mean, they're not known as party goers, right? Alex? <laughs> they decided to make it political by saying that uh, this is again another, another sign of oppression in Singapore um, about uh, uh, on the gay community. So um, indignation was formed. That's what it is. I don't know how good of a substitute it is for the circuit party. So let me make a political statement that you know we want to speak out about these issues. And please be glad that it's actually called indignation, not some other thing. Because I, in an interview, somebody told me that again, I bet it's a bunch of guys. I know it's a bunch of guys going back and forth on certain names. And one very unfortunate name that was never voted on was insemination. <laughs> Indignation, which is actually a pretty good name. And indignation is another, embodies a lot of these, um, and this is when you start to mobilize more in the open in the, in the, uh, from the mid 2000s onward. Indignation has many, many examples of how the pragmatic system takes its tactical form. Uh, for instance, one of the most classic ones is let's say, oh, this was when Alex was also involved in one of these. Um, there was a paper by an academic, not me, or was not yet in in my doctorate program at the time. Actually, I was, I was, but anyway, somebody else. Uh, wanted to give a paper on uh, 377 and 377A. Uh, this person is not Singaporean. Uh, so in order to give a talk, they had to get a license. Because uh, some laws changed around that time. They said that if the Singaporean who is a speaker, who is giving an indoor public talk, no license is needed. But this person did not fall within uh, these requirements. So they were not able to obtain a license for this talk. But what Alex and his uh, peers did was he and somebody else became the speaker. Because they're Singaporean, so they're entitled to speak without having a license. So they read this person's paper or speech or whatever. And so the, the talk sort of managed to carry out. In that particular instance, the speaker never came to Singapore. Uh, but in some other instances, let's say this, this, the, the top license was denied and the Singaporean stands up in place as the officially designated speaker, the foreigner who is not allowed to be the official speaker will be in the audience. So during Q&A, we can ask questions, right? It's just chat. And the, you're not actually, yeah, that person is not a speaker. So you still manage to have interaction with the foreign speaker, but you're still completely abiding by the law. You're still legally legitimate because you, know, you manage to meet the restrictions. Singaporean speaking as an official speaker, nothing wrong with that, and so on. So that's a very classic example. And Alex did one as well. He tried to put up this photo exhibition of kissing at different people. I took photos of people, uh, same sex. Uh, well, I'm not sure that same-sex couples, but people of the same-sex kissing. And wasn't able to obtain um, uh, an exhibition license for it. So what he did was, I think he gave the talk about his photographs many, many times. In the, and he's a Singapore, so he can give a talk. And the talk comes under this exemption. And he can give the talk many, many times. But to give his talk, he had to explain what the photos are. So he had to show his photos, right? <laughs> so he managed to show and uh, exhibit his photos. So that's another example of how uh, the tactical form of pragmatic resistance takes place by, at the same time, keeping to the political norms that I mentioned in the very beginning. All right, enough of indignation. Let's move on to uh, Repeal 377A. There was another example during the period of time when people were mobilizing more and more, but and wasn't this time, it wasn't just gay people working for their community. It had uh, straight allies who were signing the petition. If some of you were maybe too young, scary to think about it, to remember Repeal 377A, it, was, it took place in the year 2007 when the penal code was up for review and amendment. It was a comprehensive review and amendment. And it turned out that uh, 377A uh, was going to be retained, whereas 377 would be repealed. By repealing three, uh, 377 uh, and keeping 377A, it meant that only um, gay men 
were targeted now by the law, whereas when 377 was in place, at least certain forms of acts were all uh, um, banned, whether or not you were homosexual or homosexual or otherwise. Right? So that means that the, the sort of discrimination, not that it was not discriminatory, but 377 and 377 were in place, but by removing 377 and deliberately keeping 377A, that made the discrimination even more visible and more intentional. So there was sort of mobilization around that to sign a petition to bring attention to this issue. Uh, the petition was one that was submitted to Parliament, and overall there was more than to, uh, close to 3,000 people had signed, and there were parents, friends, siblings, uh, co-workers, people were straight, who signed. And these petitions had to be, what do you call it? You had to sign it, it is the original submission, you cannot photocopy or scan it and email it, right, to the people who are collecting it. So you have some really touching stories from like Singaporeans overseas who uh, use FedEx or whatever to send back the original of their living nearby, they will actually come home and drop it off at the collection centers. So still repeal 377. So this is, you're now mobilizing more in the open. So, uh, unfortunately, um, the, uh, the parliament did not uh, decide to go ahead without amending 377A or repealing it. But that sort of created a certain sense of momentum at the time. And then around this period, Pink Dot was also uh, the first Pink Ducks was started in 2009. Uh, that was also in line with or in response to a small change in the regulations again. Um, Pauline Park, um, in 2008, November, uh, the exemption where you could speak at Pauline Park without license, just pre-register with the police, was expected to allow so called performances and assemblies. Right, so now it wasn't, wasn't a speaking. You could actually hold gatherings in Holly Park if you sign uh, or you pre-register. The, the pre-registration comes with conditions. You cannot talk about race, religion in a way that could cause an, uh, what do you call it, anonymity. Well, of course, it's all subject to interpretation as what as to what that means. But um, some of the more creative people would thought, well, maybe we could use the park to do some kind, um, hold some kind of uh, gay rally. Came about. In the very beginning, it was a discussion of maybe wanting to do a parade, um, but uh, that idea was not carried through, I think, for several reasons. One is that parade connotes one point to the next. You can call me party walking round and round. <laughs> <laughs> and also, the people were very conscious about the idea that uh, sort of protests or demonstrations are seen as uh, illegitimate because people have done it, have committed civil disobedience. Uh, we're talking about not talking in the yard because you're sort of confined to this area. But it's um, it also, in a, in, in despite this confinement, has managed to grow quite significantly. And, and I know there are criticisms against about it as well. But the reason that you have those criticisms is a good problem. Because in the beginning, people would just worry about whether anybody would even show up at the park. That was a real concern. Whether anybody would come up at the park for, for an event that could be seen as gay and as seen as a political demonstration. Now we have your problems about not being inclusive. I think that's a good problem to have. And, um, it should be addressed, but it's a good problem to have. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's Pink Dot. Um, and so uh, this is the, the, uh, the same slide I put up at the beginning about the trajectory of the movement over time. And I hope I've shown you at least snapshots of it, how movement has come up more in the open in the course of one to 20 years. And the diversification, expansion, escalation of tactics, as well as shifting of media space and political attitudes uh, as well. So now, briefly, I'm sorry, I wrote a little bit over time is what does it tell me about rights? In the book, I talk about different uh, different meanings of law and rights. I'm going to focus on rights here. Um, well, this is me and somebody else. <laughs> you can read it. It's what I call a polyvocality of rights. Uh, the different uh, rights speaks in different voices, have different meanings in Singapore. And what really struck me was what this person said about speaking multiple languages. He's not talking about Chinese, English, and so on. talking about different ways you, you speak. You speak a different language to the gay community. You speak a different language when you engage the larger society. And you speak a different language when you talk to the government or bureaucrats. Um, so what do rights mean? 
for many of the activists I spoke to, rights is an embodiment of movement objectives. You want to get equality in the law. For example, you're killing P778, having equal rights as an objective, right? Uh, but rights also mean has this sort of amorphous meaning of being trade-off and also being very circumspective about how much you can get rights in Singapore. It's trade-off in the sense that activists identify very clearly that the Singaporean government treats rights as a trade-off for economic progression and the engineer idea of social harmony and that uh, there, there is this giving up of certain rights for these other material gains over the course of time. And that is why they feel that they're very, they have circumspection about whether rights can work, rights discourse, rights speak. That, I, that open claim for rights can actually be achieved um, in, 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 in civil, uh, by civil society. Um, for example, you know, in the current litigation, court litigation right now of uh, Section 377 a trying to repeal, trying to have the law invalidated on the grounds that it's a violation of the right to equality. People are very circumspect, uh, circumspection about how that kind of discourse can work. It did not work in the parliament back in the late 2000s, right? But at the same time, that's why it's sort of a conflicting ideas or notions about rights, is that rights also have this quite everyday snowballing effect, is that when you raise people's rights consciousness in the gay community about, even though these rights are not recognized in the law, about the right to be happy, the right to be who you are, this is all everyday language that you use, but you use your it sort of a language of rights, that you have the right to be equal to everybody else. This sort of creates a sense of, belonging or political consciousness. Some people are willing to sort of join the activist groups and take up action, not just for yourself, but for others. Although perhaps after 20 years, um, people like Alex may feel a little bit more um, uncertain about the future of activism, but that there is a sense that rights has the effect of quietly recruiting or changing people's minds about joining activism and actually wanting to do something about it. So there is sort of a sense of, so I see that rights also has this quite snowballing effect of getting people together to work together as, 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 a, as a social movement. In, in that sense, that's why I think that this, uh, rights has different meaning, different layers of it um, in the community, despite the open I sense that you cannot speak openly about it and it might not work in political discourse. So what does, that takes me to talking finally about the politics of gay rights in Singapore. I am not going to say too much, except to say that uh, because of these circumspection about rights and how uh, Singapore state has characterized um, the rules for, do we, uh, for, for civil society cannot be confrontational. I, even activists perceive it to be that way. Um, you know, have to be uh, careful about social, uh, this image of portraying of, of appearance of social harmony and legal legitimacy and so on. Um, to the extent that the gay community or gay groups here um, work on issues of gay rights, the politics of gay rights is an unusual set of politics in Singapore because just because rights is not uh, in unlike in places where rights is a normal way of doing politics, right? In places like the United States, for, for instance, same-sex marriage, uh, the, the litigation of same-sex marriage gets a lot of traction we, when you're able to frame for mainstream society it is an issue about rights. Whereas here, rights discourse is not a mainstream issue. So politics of gay rights is an unusual one. It's an unusual set of politics that we see here. And I, I'm, I'm, for the, in the interest of time, I'm not going to say anymore. I'm going to, and then uh, we can talk uh, during Q&A if you're interested about what are some of the pitfalls or problems with pragmatic resistance. And you got to keep going routine resistance as a sense of lack of uh, more openly challenging institutions and so on. I talk about this in the book, but I'm going to have to stop here and say thank you.